Good morning, everyone. Thank you for joining the webinar. This webinar is brought to you by the Energy Network. I am Diana DeKeek of Build It Green. I will be the webinar moderator today. Before we begin, we'll go over a few housekeeping items. All attendees have been placed on mute, and this webinar will be recorded. If you have a question you would like to ask, please go ahead and type it in the chat box, and we'll be sure to answer your question at our Q&A session at the end of our presentation. If you're having trouble seeing or hearing the webinar, let us know. If you're experiencing an echo and are using audio through your computer, you may want to try calling in again using a landline telephone. This webinar is about multifamily building code updates. We will highlight the new code measures as they relate to existing multifamily homes that undergo a remodel, addition, or major retrofit. Our speaker today is Nathan Krantz. Nathan Krantz is the principal for Krantz Consultants. Nathan brings more than 12 years of experience in the green building, sustainability, and construction industry, managing and certifying green buildings within the commercial, public, and residential building sectors across the country. Nathan holds a commissioning authority certification. He is a licensed California architect. Lead AP, Greenpoint Raider, BPI, NCI, and HERS certified. Nathan is also a certified energy plans examiner. Let's all welcome Nathan. Hi, everybody. Thanks for uh, attending the webinar. Uh, can everybody see my screen right now? Dan, I seem to have a issue with the connection here. just want to confirm we can see my screen. Yes, uh, we can see your screen. OK, great. So my name is Nathan Kranz, as she mentioned. And I've been working with uh, a lot of multifamily builders over the years. And in particular, there's been uh, sort of increasing uh, discussions and concerns about what's happening with the new code. And today's session is about the new energy code for 2013, which will take effect uh, July 1st this year. And in particular, I have uh, put together a summary of code items that pertain to existing multifamily projects uh, in California. And so because it's multifamily, there is uh, a unique combination of residential and non-residential code requirements. And this is a summary of those uh, code items. There are additional sessions available through the California Energy Commission and other uh, organizations. And these are sometimes two days long of uh, coverage for the code. So this one hour session is clearly a summary of some of the highlighted important changes that's happened from the previous code. And so I'm going to go through those today. Uh, and at the end of the session, um, as we mentioned, there will be some Q&A for those people who have some additional questions. So without further ado, let's go uh, get going here and uh, talk about the, uh, the new code. Um, this is the energy code, which is part of Tile 24. Tile 24 is the building code for the state of California. And this is part six of Tile 24, uh, in particular for the energy code. So there's also plumbing code and mechanical code. There's the Cal Green code and so forth. All those are different parts. Of Tile 24. This is part six in particular, and for the new uh, code cycle for 2013. Uh, the agenda for today is basically a brief introduction of this code. Then we're going to talk about the mandatory revisions of the code, those items that are required to be done by projects. And then in particular, we'll go into some of the details about additions and alterations for those smaller projects that have just a few uh, revisions to the building that, that are, that are going to happen. Uh, and then, like I said, followed by Q&A. Uh, Nathan, it seems like we're having some technical difficulties. We've lost your screen. OK. Unfortunately, we can't see your presentation. OK. Apologize for that. A little technical difficulty. Let me. Look at the connection here.
Bear with me just one second. Okay, so I'm, I'm just, uh, looks like I lost connection to the um, internet there, so I'm just reconnecting here. Just be a moment. We apologize for this inconvenience. Uh, it'll just take a few more minutes and we'll begin shortly. Thanks for waiting, I'll just be one moment, thank you. Thank you for your patience, everyone. We'll begin in just a moment. All right, Diana, I appear to be back online, so if you want to share my screen, we should be good to go here. Okay.
Okay, I think we're up and running again? Yes. Um, okay, great. I, we can see your screen. Again, sorry right, for you. this inconvenience. Okay, so um, as I was mentioning earlier, I wanted to go over the uh, new energy code. I'm going to start with the introductions, then the mandatory revisions, and then the additions and alterations. So let's uh, get back on track here. Uh, the, this energy code uh, is the 2013 energy code. Uh, previously, there was the 2010 energy code. Uh, and the change from that code cycle to this one was roughly about a 25 to 30 percent increase or improved energy efficiency from the previous energy code. And so if you're a residential building, building in 2010 standards, uh, if you were to build that same home today under the 2013 standards, you'd be 25 percent more efficient on average across uh, the state of California. Currently, we are in the 2014 year. Uh, the code cycles, when they are adopted, there is a, a sort of lag time for the cities and, and other organizations to get up to speed with those new code requirements. And so uh, because we've had some improved energy modeling and software, they have delayed the code cycle to begin July 1st, 2014. So right now, uh, we are in April. Uh, July 1st, 2014 is when the cities will begin requiring or, or enforcing the new energy code. And so if you submit typically for a permit, for a building permit, uh, prior to that date, you would be still using the 2010 energy code for your project. The code cycles are every three years, roughly. And the goal of the California Energy Commission is to have net zero homes by 2020. So we're just a few code cycles away from that uh, goal. And for commercial buildings, the idea is to have a net zero building by 2030. So in theory, uh, if we go forward with these code revisions and achieve this, the goal of the California Energy Commission, all new buildings built after 2020 will be net zero. In other words, the energy they consume will equal the energy they produce. And that production is typically through solar panels, uh, wind generation, and other, other forms of renewable energy. So it's a lofty goal. And this incremental step at 2010, 2013 is roughly 25% improvement. And the goal is to get there uh, with net zero by 2020 for residential. And we'll start to see more and more uh, of the code, including solar, as a part of the equation. And so we're starting to see some of that now with the roof areas and so forth. But we'll go over that in more detail. So it's exciting times. Uh, but just keep in mind, every three years, we're going to have a new code cycle and need to know what those new standards are. And that's for all building codes uh, in particular. The energy code uh, acknowledges that there are different climates throughout the state of California. And so there are different climate zones for your building. And so depending on your climate zone, you might have different code requirements for your building. Uh, for example, on the coast, where uh, it's not extreme temperatures as the mountains or the desert, uh, there is essentially less uh, requirements for your home. Unlike in the desert, there's more scrutiny on insulation and, uh, and uh, efficiency for your HVAC system for those areas. The energy code references what is called the compliance manual. And the compliance manual goes in more detail about those tests and code requirements for the home. Uh, the previous energy code referenced the compliance manual that had about 570 pages. We now have 1,006 pages in this reference manual. Now, a lot of them are the appendices, which include the PERS forms. But nonetheless, there's a large uh, reference manual that's needed to understand the code in more detail. Um, so when looking at a building requirement, it's important to have not only the code reference, but also have the residential and non-residential compliance manuals to understand what is needed for your uh, building. The, the stages happen through the construction process between permits and construction. And there's various forms that are being filled out to reference and ensure the energy code compliance is happening. One of the main forms that's used is called the CF1R, and that's a HERS form that basically summarizes what's being done for the home or building and the code requirements to do so. Uh, that 
form has not changed from the last code. Uh, it's still the same, same name uh, convention, CF1R. What has changed are the HERS and then contractor compliance forms. Uh, during the construction stage, the contractor would fill out what was previously the CF6R is now called the CF2R, and then the HERS rater comes out and verifies those items are still in place um, and samples them potentially. It's called a CF3R. So now it's a logical one, two, three uh, step format for the form, CF1R, CF2R, and CF3R. Um, so the logical order as, as it was not so logical previously under the 2010 code. And the enforcement is going to be done through the city or county uh, or local jurisdiction. And so it's up to the city and county to enforce these codes. Uh, the state has said, here are the codes to follow, but it's really up to the city and county and how they enforce them and their particulars. So this discussion today is about the state code. It's very important to know that cities and counties can amend and potentially have greater requirements for their area. So uh, if working on a project, it's important to know which city or county that is in and what additional requirements they would have uh, potentially with the code. So it's important to follow up with them and see what is needed. Uh, one aspect that's supposed to be enforced is that these forms are registered online. And this registration helps ensure the HERS rater is documenting and show their information. And this allows for verification for the HERS rater and to show the benefit or improved benefits that are happening with the buildings. If there are errors or issues or delays in enforcement, um, this registry will help show that and inform potential future code revisions. And for example, the duct leakage uh, requirement. If everyone is passing this on the first go and all this is being recorded, it, it appears that the industry has gotten up to speed and that, that most of the people understand and can pass the duct leakage test. However, if there are additional failures happening and that's being recorded um, and improvements happening over time, then we know there's some difficulty there of making this code happen, and perhaps the next code cycle will not be so stringent uh, to make that more difficult because um, it's taken a while for the industry to get up to speed with those items. So it's important to register the forms and to follow through to help communicate just how well the projects are going forward with the code enforcement. This information can be found at the state's website energy.california.gov. You can go to the Tile 24 section and then look under 2013 standards where you can download the reference manual uh, in HERS forms. So let's now go into the mandatory measures and talk about the different sections. Uh, again, these are about the revisions from the previous code. I'm not going to go over every single code item, but the really highlighted important items are going to be noted here. The first section here we're talking about is the cool roof. Uh, and the cool roof is defined in the requirements by the CRRC, which is the Cool Roof Rating Council. And they have cool roof uh, reflectance requirements for both low and steep, slo steep sloped roofs. The idea is the low roof, which is somewhat flat, needs to have a greater reflectance because it's directly facing the uh, sun to the home, while steep roofs are allowed a lower uh, reflectance, uh, and therefore you're seeing a higher reflectance value. Uh, zero would have very little, uh, I'm, I'm sorry, very high reflectance, and one being uh, very less. And so we have a lower number uh, for the solar reflectance for the steep roofs. In terms of insulation on the thermal envelope, the thermal envelope being the exterior shell of the, of the building where we have the difference between the outside and the inside, uh, we have insulation requirements. Uh, for the ceiling is R30, which for the most part is standard uh, practice now for the ceiling or attic insulation. For the wall, we have R13 and R19. And it's important to note that if you have a 2 by 6 wall, which is a little bit bigger wall, that R19 is the minimum value. And I believe the reason for that is R13 insulation, which is meant for a 2 by 4 wall, if it was included in a 2 by 6 wall, there would be a large air gap in every uh, wall cavity. And that air gap causes convection currents within the space 
it really diminishes the R value that's actually installed. And so therefore, R19 is the minimum value for our 2 by 6 walls. Raised floor is R19 minimum. And then in particular, I've noted in red here, the non-residential on the raise, on the floor is R3.7. And so if we have uh, a condition for multifamily where there's maybe a carport or parking garage in the lower floor, the the uh, floor condition between the garage and that space above uh, would be a minimum of R3.7 uh, for, that, for that location. If you have a concrete slab condition, if you're not quite meeting that R value, you might use rigid insulation or other forms to insulate that one location. In terms of the radiant barrier, which is, uh, again, another way to help repel the heat, uh, sun's heat from above, uh, the radiant barrier is required in zones 2 through 15, which is almost all of these zones in California. And this is going to be a mandatory measure. Uh, if you are using performance modeling to uh, perhaps not use the radiant barrier, you would need to improve the energy performance somewhere else in the equation for it to work. But as a baseline, radiant barrier is a mandatory measure in zones 2 through 15 uh, for, your, for your building. And that includes the gable ends of the roof structure as well. Uh, windows and fenestration, they've cleaned up the, the summary page on the table 3.4 from before. Um, they simplified this, and now we have just two columns for requirements. Uh, for kind of zones 1, 3, and 5, we have a 0.32 U-factor, uh, and we have uh, the same for zones 2, 4, and, and zones six through 16. Uh, so now we have U factor requirements for both residential and non-residential. We have SHGC, which is your solar heat gain coefficient, and that's basically how well does the light reflect, or I should say solar uh, heat reflect from the window. Uh, sometimes that's used with glazing uh, properties. Uh, back in the day, you might see a strong window tint on a limo. You know, that basically is a very poor uh, allowance for light, for the visible light, but it's a great way to repel um, the solar heat gain in those, in those windows. There's also maximum fenestration area for those walls. So uh, a wall that's all windows, again, if you're going to be greater than 20 percent, you need to accommodate that with improved energy somewhere else in the equation. But as a baseline, we have a 20 percent uh, glazing uh, percentage for those walls. In terms of air leakage, uh, the code now is saying that you must seal and caulk those leakage areas. So where we have penetrations at the uh, plumbing wall or electrical, those are being foamed or sealed at the top plate or uh, sill plate, and so there's no air leakage coming from that wall cavity. And the idea is to not allow air movement within the walls where you have insulation. That air movement causes the R value to diminish. And so we're really trying to seal all six sides of those cavities with the insulation, and so that no air is, is moving through that space. If we are looking at the new HVAC systems, uh, duct sealing and the watt draw are mandatory measures. Uh, duct sealing is the air ducts between the condition spaces and the HVAC system, and those are to be sealed. Uh, typically in the past, uh, duct leakage was a big part of of uh, energy loss. Typically, it was about 20% of the air leakage was happening at the ductwork, and that was going into the attic or unconditioned spaces. And so to save some energy and improve uh, performance, those ducts are being now required to be sealed uh, as a mandatory measure. The watt draw, the watt draw is basically the watts or energy drawn from the HVAC system, and, and that would typically go higher with uh, blockage in the, in the ducts if we had uh, improper filtration installed and so forth. And so there's also a watt draw mandatory measure in that you're not to exceed that watt draw uh, energy performance as that also causes uh, in-performance of the system and uh, potentially a reduction of the life of the HVAC system. If duct systems are to exceed 10 feet in length, which is majority of homes, although multifamily, uh, you might have a reduced system, but if it's exceeding 10 feet in length, 
uh, we required to have a MERV-6 filter for that HVAC unit. MERV-6 is the uh, filtration level of the filter. Uh, the higher the number, the, the more filter, the more capture of, of particulates and so forth is being done. Typically, a clean room is at about a MERV-18 or MERV-20. And so we're raising the bar on improved filtration of the air, which helps not only the occupant, also helps the system from uh, additional dust and dirt that might uh, cause gradation in the uh, fans and so forth. It's important that there is a pressure drop requirement with this. If you uh, install a, a filter that is MERV 6 or higher and the system is not designed for that additional load, you will have potentially a watt drop issue and a pressure drop issue which would uh, reduce the efficiency of that system. So it's important that the HVAC system can accommodate the MERV filter that you're using for that unit. Uh, so MERV 6 being the minimum requirement there. With, with the uh, air systems, there's also the ASHRAE 62.2 standard. ASHRAE 62 is the ventilation standard uh, that is being used as a baseline here as well. So as we go forward, we see standards referencing other standards, this being one of them. Here's the code referencing an ASHRAE standard. So you need to also look up and know what this standard is about. Uh, the big part about this ventilation is where is air coming from to breathe? And right now, the ASHRAE 62.2 allows for two methods of ventilation. One is the exhaust ventilation method, which I, I believe will be eventually phased out. The, the actual intent of this is that the fans are on, creating a negative pressure, and that negative pressure is drawing air from the cracks and crevices. But as we're sealing up these units, make them tighter and tighter, this methodology will eventually just not make sense. Um, the other option is the true intent, which is a supply ventilation system, where you actually have a duct that you can control the size, you can filter and, and uh, filter the air, and bring that in uh, to the unit. So a supply duct would accommodate that. Or right now, the exhaust ventilation method is also allowed by a negative pressure. Uh, the third option is a combination, where you might have a combination of of exhaust fans as well as supply to provide the ventilation to the units. Back with the duct work, there's also an improved insulation value. Uh, we went from R4.2 to now R6. So we're a little thicker, a little more improved insulation around the duct work. If we have, uh, as multifamily, the spaces are tight and we have chases to bring the ducts uh, from space to space, space to space to the outside, you now need to accommodate not only the duct size, but also the insulation size around it for those chases. So now we're now at R6 is a greater uh, insulation value. And, and part of that uh, intent is that you have conditioned air in that duct, and you want to insulate that to keep it uh, contained to go to those conditioned spaces. In addition, if you had a, a big extreme change between uh, temperatures from the outside to the inside, Potentially, there's condensation and other issues that could happen at the ducts. So it's important uh, that ducts or condition spaces are being insulated uh, at those locations. And this duct insulation is required for also indirectly conditioned spaces. That's an important change from before. Uh, the, chase, the chases that you typically see in multifamily, uh, that is an indirectly conditioned space. A condition space directly would be if you saw a ductwork in your unit, that would be in the condition space. Uh, unconditioned space is the attic, right? So the indirectly conditioned space is a safe area where even though it's in the unit, it's covered with the drywall, which have you, that still needs to have insulation in those locations. So that's an important change uh, that's, that's going to happen uh, with this new code cycle is that you do need the R6 in those indirectly conditioned chases in the unit. And at the HVAC system, there is a requirement to include the, basically the, the hole, the pressure drop hole, where you can actually install the pressure probe to test the pressure drop. That hole is meant to be installed uh, by the installing contractor or the, or the supplier of the HVAC system. Uh, 
So that way, when the herder comes out and do the pressure drop testing, the hole is already provided, and they can just bring their probe in, do the test, and go. Um, in the past, when those holes weren't provided, the herds raider would have to find, drill a hole, and hopefully find the, the right location with the ideal performance, but that's no longer allowed. The idea is that hole is already installed, so the, the uh, herds raider can come out and quickly do their work and, and find the right location to have the best performance uh, to test the pressure within the HVAC system. The HVAC performance is based on the sear and ear levels. Here is seasonal energy uh, ratio, and the EER is the uh, energy uh, ratio. Sear is meant to be an average over the whole year, both you know fall, winter, spring. What is the overall performance for the unit across the year on average? The EER is really meant to be what is performance at its max condition, and that's typically your hottest day of the year. Uh, how well does your HVAC cool the system on the hottest day? And so ideally in this climate, you want to know what that EER level is and really try to maximize that as much as you can. Of course, there's probably some cost or size issues with doing that, but these levels are going up, um, not necessarily on July 1st, but as you look on this chart here, uh, we have January 1st, 2015 for new SEER and EER requirements. So we have about another eight months or so before these new SEER and EER requirements are required for HVAC systems. So keep that in mind when you're designing your systems, purchasing your equipment, uh, when that January 1st, 2015 date comes in. And with the higher SEER and EER values, again, there will probably be an increase in price. Uh, you have a more efficient system, which might be a larger system, so keep that in mind when you're designing your spaces. In terms of HVAC systems, there's also the condenser requirement. And I don't usually see this as a problem for multifamily. It's more single family uh, projects that have an issue with this. But the condensers must be at least five feet away from the closed dry vent. And that is, again, a maintenance uh, operational issue. We don't want the lint and so forth uh, contaminating and causing blockage at the condenser and allow for proper evaporation at the coil. In addition, the vapor retardant uh, covering is required. And so we have typically the refrigerant line going to the condenser and it's insulated uh, for that line. Well, that insulation, the black portion of that image there, with the sun, it basically degrades that. It becomes brittle and dry and breaks apart. And so they're wanting now an improved way to protect that from the sun's rays and other, other uh, aspects. And so now there's a required class one or two vapor retardant uh, requirement for that covered refrigerant line. In terms of HVAC systems, we have a mandatory pipe insulation for uh, pipes that are greater than 3 quarter inch or greater. We have a cap three or cap four type B straight straight pipe uh, required for gas water heaters. And uh, the gas supply line must provide at least 200,000 BTUs per hour capacity. Uh, this is an important piece because there are projects that want to convert from a tank water heater to a tankless water heater. And typically those tankless water heaters require a higher capacity of gas supply. And so rather than re-pipe all the way back to the water heater, they're now wanting this as a standard uh, size piping to those locations. In terms of lighting, uh, most of the lighting remained the same for the most part. They did move the lighting controls to Title 20, which is the controls portion of the code. Uh, but they basically clarified and simplified most of the code items to make it a little easier to understand. One of the big changes that, that is, uh, I think, a rather uh, big issue is that the Lighting must be high efficacy, such as fluorescent or LED, and have a vacancy sensor control in the utility area. So where you have a closet, uh, utility space, typically we, we could have a uh, occupancy sensor or a fluorescent light, but now we need to do both. We need to have both a high efficiency light and a sensor so that it turns off when you're not present in those spaces. So that's a rather 
large change to code, although maybe those closets aren't, well, there's not a lot of closets and so forth in these spaces, but nonetheless, it is a change that needs to happen, both high efficacy and the vacancy sensor in those areas. Uh, the lighting levels for non-residential has gone up quite a bit. Uh, there is now multi-level lighting shutoff controls for corridors. That's a rather big deal for multifamily. Uh, so in the past, we've had corridor lights on pretty much 24-7. Now they must have shutoff controls so that as people use the corridors or not use them, they will shut off with uh, occupancy sensors. And so that's, that's a rather large change for the non-residential spaces. In addition, on the exterior lighting, there is what's called the BUG uh, rating. The BUG stands for backlight, uplight, and glare. And so with an exterior light pole, you have your backlight from the pole side. Uh, you have your uplight, what's going up into the space. And then your glare is your light value, if you, could, if you could directly see the bulb on the exterior lights. And so there are BUG light ratings for your exterior lighting, depending on where your building is located. If you're in a city center with high uh, lights around the city, you are allowed a higher allowance for your bug rating. If you're out in the rural areas, you'd have uh, a lower bug rating for those exterior lights. So that's, that's something that when looking for lighting, make sure you understand what is the bug rating uh, for that light fixture. And also the height. So light, lights that have a certain bug rating, the higher you raise them from the uh, floor surface or ground surface, potentially the, the values will increase as well as you have broader cast of its uh, light range. Let's go into uh, additions and alterations. So those are all mandatory requirements for uh, large construction projects, for new construction and so forth. But what's, what if we're going to do a small multifamily project that has very little scope? What's needed then? Well, there's the section for additions and alterations to kind of accommodate those smaller projects. Still, some of these mandatory items will, will be seen throughout, but uh, there are some abridged forms to be used. And, and one of the exceptions is if the alteration or addition is less than 300 square feet, uh, you may be exempt from doing energy performance. Again, it's up to the city or county to determine what their threshold, but in terms of state requirements, less than 300 square feet, um, you may be exempt from needing the CF1R or 2R forms. However, if a HERS test is, is required for some reason, it will then trigger the forms to be used because the HERS is, is acting as uh, energy performance through the verification. Uh, if you're doing a simple window change or other pieces, it's possible that no HERS testing would be required for the simple change outs, water heater, water heater replacements or, or roof replacements. But again, follow up with the city to see what they're going to require on top of the state requirements. Here's an example of a HERS form, and this is for an addition or alteration. Uh, the standard mandatory forms are similar, uh, but you're looking for the key uh, abbreviations in the naming. This is called the CF1R uh, ALT, standing for alteration. And so here's a, a summarized CF1R for an alteration. It's just going to have a lot less information than a standard CF1R for a typical large project. Uh, you're looking for signatures. So when submitting to the city, they're going to look for is the author signed off? Is it been registered? It's important that these portions of the forms be filled out electronically, so they know that it's been signed and submitted to the registry. For additions that uh, are going for a prescriptive approach, there are some requirements for uh, additions and based on the size. So the larger the addition, the more requirements potentially are needed. And so here's package A requirements depending on the size. If it's less than 400, if it's 400, 700 square feet or greater than 700 square feet, the requirements for the roof conditions uh, for those size projects. For additions and alterations, uh, 
the CFNR data does not include the area affected from the existing condition. The important part with this is that we are trying to improve a home that's existing from its original condition. And in order to do that, we must note what the existing condition was to make that improvement. And that typically needs to be verified by a HERS rater. In the past, we have just taken word of by the contractor owner, here's the information, it's in the form, and, and making the improvements. Now it must be verified of what the existing conditions were before the improvement. So it's important now for the contractor owner to engage a HERS rater prior to construction, they can verify the existing home conditions. Having them brought out at the time of construction and completion is going to be too late. We need to verify before and after now the conditions of the improved existing home. The uh, envelope requirements for performance additions, performance meaning uh, performance model, you can, you can uh, give or take uh, different categories to show the overall energy performance. If you wanted to have a less efficient window, for example, than, than standard requirements, you need to have an improved energy efficiency somewhere else in the equation for it to show uh, a passing performance. And so here we have a, an existing addition and alteration project. Uh, the budget must show um, the existing conditions verified by the HERS rater again, as mentioned earlier. There's additions, uh, there are alterations for the different locations. We have the air distribution system. We have the window fenestration. Uh, these are all dependent upon the third party verification of those systems. And so it's important that this is being verified and we're verifying the different categories of energy performance. So we're looking at the insulation, the before condition. We're looking at the window sizes and types. We're looking if there's any window film on those windows. Uh, what's the space hitting or cooling equipment? What kind of ductwork do we have? All these are items that we're going to be verifying before we start construction to show that existing condition of the uh, of the project. And when the first forms are filled out, if we're showing this improved energy savings by including a HERS test, all the HERS measures and existing condition measures will be noted on the bottom of the form. And so here's the CF1R. Look on the last page under the M section. These shows all the HERS verification summary items to be done. And this one's highlighting all the existing conditions to be highlighted and verified. And so it's simplified. There's an easy location. Look at the last page. This lists all the HERS items that need to be done. And that way they can understand the scope of work and, uh, again, existing conditions being done before work starts on the project. Here's a descriptive uh, section for package A, and then there are some exceptions. And so there, these exceptions are going to apply to the smaller projects. So here's the replacement of the fenestration. As long as it's less than 25 square feet, uh, there are some exceptions here based on certain zones. So it's important, again, to know what's the size of your work, what are you, what are you changing out, and what climate zone are you in to see if there's any exceptions from uh, the HERS or energy requirements. Uh, if your work includes upgrades or replacements on an alteration, you need to follow the mandatory requirements for that system as a baseline. So if you're just changing out the, or upgrading the HVAC system, you must follow the mandatory measures that we noted earlier. If you're doing multiple systems, you then have some performance opportunities. But prescriptive-wise, if you're just limiting to prescriptive requirements, you must follow those mandatory measures for that system. Again, they're noted on the very bottom what uh, HERS forms and what HERS requirements are needed. Here's, again, another. Uh, image from a CF1R, and under C and D, it lists all of the compliance forms that are going to be needed by the contractor uh, and the HERS rater. For HVAC changeouts, uh, death leakage will be required for all zones. So as we change out our HVAC system, and if there is duct work, the duct leakage will be required as a part of the 
uh, testing verification so the system is working properly. Uh, that's that's uh, it, the best gets, I'll be honest, is a difficult thing at times for multifamily. Uh, it's hard sometimes to access the ductwork, uh, but keep in mind, if you're going to switch out HVAC systems, the ductwork is a part of that change out. And in addition, you have the refrigerant charge for certain zones as well. So you have the proper refrigerant charge in the system. Re-roofing. Uh, Re-roofing, uh, if you're replacing more than 50% uh, of the roof, that roof must follow the cool roof requirements. Again, you need to know if your roof is a steep slope, as in greater than 2 and 12 pitch, or a low slope. And with those, you'll have certain reflectance requirements uh, R values for those roofs. And I know we're running out of time here, but I want to uh, just sort of summarize all of these different pieces. We talked about overall what the energy code is about and what's happening with the 2020 goals, 2030 goals by the CEC. Uh, we talked about the mandatory measures at first. All those are mandatory and required uh, for the most part. If you're going to use performance approach, you might be able to do a give and take between those different sections, it's important that the Cal 24 report is uh, registered and hopefully a, a well-qualified person is performing those Cal 24 uh, forms. Bring on a HERS rater early uh, so they can verify those existing conditions before you start demolition or other aspects of the project. And then you also need to identify the existing conditions and what's being changed out. Uh, we do want to meet the energy code minimum, and so it's important that that's being done, which might happen through uh, PERS measures for improved performance. It's important to review all the mandatory requirements for the project. And as we're moving forward with this industry, we're moving from a tradesman to more of a craftsman part of the industry. We're now getting real uh, you know, craft in our installation methods for insulation, uh, and really taking pride in the work that we're doing, uh, and, and it's also being verified. So those who can meet the requirements and take pride in their work, uh, they'll, they'll have success. But uh, we are having improved stricter measures. We're having greater verification that items are being installed properly, and if so, uh, that will show improved energy performance and improved overall home and comfort. Uh, with these changes, it's all about education, and the fact that you're here on this call, you're being educated about some of these uh, code requirements. And so, as the industry gets educated, we'll understand and, and know what's needed. Uh, so this is the first step. So education is important for the trade, for the supplier. We all need to know what's required to make sure we have uh, success the first time through. So let's stop with that. If there's any questions, I believe Diana will be reciting some of those that were typed in here. Uh, yes, we do have a few questions, and um, we do have a few minutes before the webinar ends, so we might be able just to answer one or two. Um, one question was just to clarify about mandatory measures. Are there any trade-offs, for example, for radiant barrier? Right, great question. So mandatory measures are mandatory. Uh, there are two ways to show performance. There's the prescriptive approach and performance approach of the modeling. And so prescriptive means you're going to be prescribed to make these improvements, and those will note all the mandatory measures in that location. If you're going to go forward with a performance approach, it allows some give and take. And that give and take means that you could potentially have less than code on some item and have a greater code somewhere else. So if you're going to not do radiant barrier, which is less than code, you need to do improved energy performance somewhere else. Improved energy performance, maybe have less windows, greater insulation somewhere else. So you are allowed to not have it, um, but there is a give and take, and you must use performance approach to show that in your Tile 24 report. Um, would you be able to go through how some of the items would be affected for a retrofit. For example, if you're working with an existing ventilation system, uh, are, is that required to go through the mandatory measures and code as well? 
Right, great question. So if you're doing a retrofit, let's say uh, all you want to do is change out the furnace or, or the HVAC system. Well, the trigger, uh, as I mentioned earlier, if you change out your HVAC system, you will be required to do duct leakage on the existing duct work. So uh, no, you don't need to replace all the duct work and have R6 insulation, but you will be required to ensure that ducts are not leaking uh, in that one particular uh, change out. So depending on what it is, uh, you'll be prescribed to follow those requirements if you're not able to uh, do a performance methodology. Retrofits typically will follow mandatory requirements for that, for that uh, particular system that you're replacing. Okay. Well, thank you, Nathan, for this informative presentation. I hope that everyone enjoyed it, and thank you, everyone, for attending. If you have additional questions, feel free to contact Nathan, uh, Nathan at krantzconsultants.com. If you have questions about upcoming trainings and webinars, feel free to contact me at dthekeek at buildagreen.org. This presentation will be shared, and it will be saved on the Build It Green YouTube channel for future access. I will also email you more information about upcoming trainings. I hope you have a nice day, and thank you for joining us. Thank you. Bye-bye.